Hi, my name is Amir Ishaq, and in this video, I'm going to introduce you to MediaSoup. I am assuming that you already have some hands on experience or even some basic knowledge on WebRTC. If not, I suggest you first watch my video series on WebRTC. So, what is MediaSoup? MediaSoup is a selective forwarding unit. SFU receives video and audio streams from endpoints and relays them to everyone else. So a peer sends a media stream and MediaSoup relays it to everyone else connected with that peer. If you look down here, you see MediaSoup in the center. This peer in blue sends media. MediaSoup relays that media to everyone in the connection. And the same thing happens for every other peer in this case. There's other scenarios where you can use, for example, in this case, many to many, you could have a few to many, one to many, and so on. If you look on the right diagram, this is a mesh topology, which is um, a WebRTC peer-to-peer -peer connection. Notice that in the SFU, with the app link, each peer is sending only one stream to MediaSoup. And on the downlink, each peer can have one or more streams. If you look on the right diagram, when implementing a WebRTC mesh topology with multiple peer-to-peer -peer connectivity, each peer incurs serious overhead, not only on the CPU usage processing the media streams, but also on the bandwidth. It is therefore recommended not to have more than three peers in a mesh. You will face all sorts of problems. There are quite a few SFUs out there, but what makes MediaSoup a good candidate for hosting your own SFU server is if you already have a solution built with Node.js or you intend to build one. This is because MediaSoup is a Node.js library and not a standalone server. You must import MediaSoup into your Node.js application. And when it comes to signaling, MediaSoup is signaling agnostic. Just like any WebRTC application you build, you are not forced into using a specific signaling service or protocol. It's your choice to go with any or build your own. MediaSoup also supports all existing WebRTC endpoints. For more details on MediaSoup documentation, just follow this link. If you look on the top right, you see a basic structure of MediaSoup implementation. MediaSoup is based on the concept of producers and consumers. Basically, how a video stream flows from a producer to a consumer. Producers send media via a media soup router and consumer receives media via the media soup router as well. To create producers and consumers, you need to create transports. Transports are created from a router and a router can represent a room. So when it comes to the concept of rooms, we use the router to represent a room. So in this case, router one is a room where you can have multiple transports and within each transport, you can have a video producer and an audio producer and another transport can be a video consumer and an audio consumer and so on. A router is created from a worker, so you can have many routers per worker. You should create one worker per CPU core. A worker runs in a single CPU core. So if you have four CPU cores, then you should limit that to four workers in your MediaSoup server. In this video, we are not going to write any code, but in the next, we will write code to demo each stage in the process of establishing a successful connection and streaming of media to and from MediaSoup with a producer and a consumer. We will see how to manually exchange parameters between participants and the server, which results in a demo of one-to-one -one communication. We will later look at how to implement group video calls in a one-to-many and many-to-many, -many, as well as a few-to-many. In this video, we will also look at a sequence diagram on how to establish a video stream from a producer to a consumer. We will also see when parameters are created and where they are consumed. We will also see what we need to do when a producer's connection is closed. In these example diagrams, the one on the left depicts 
a group video chat of three peers, you will notice that on media server, we will need to create nine transports, three per peer, three producers, because each peer is streaming media, and six consumers, because each peer is consuming media from the other two. On the right is one to many or a few to many. You will notice that on media sub server, we will need to create seven transports, three for the host and two for each of the remaining peers, three producers because each peer is streaming media and four consumers, two for the host, one each for the two peers. In this case, the peers only receive media from the host while the host receives from all the peers. Let us now look at a sequence diagram for a typical one producer and one consumer scenario. At the bottom, you will notice we have one worker, one router, two transports server side and two transports on the client side. On the client side for the producer, the local transport is a send transport and for the consumer, it's a receive transport. Starting at the top, each client makes a request to the server for router's RTP capabilities. A new device object is created and we call its load method by passing in the RTP capabilities we just received. Remember, these are router's RTP capabilities, not to be confused later with the device's RTP capabilities. Now for the producer, around the same time we call get user media to acquire its local media stream. We then send a request to media soup to create a server side WebRTC transport from the router. The server sends back to the client parameters from the server side transport. With these parameters and using the device, we create a send transport on the client side. Once we have the send transport, we call its produce method. This will cause two events of the send transport to fire off, namely the connect and the produce events. The connect event returns DTLS parameters, which we send back to the server, where a corresponding connect method of the server side transport is called and passed in with these DTLS parameters. The produce event also returns some parameters and a callback as well as an error back. And we do the same thing. We send them off to the server where a corresponding produce method of the server side is called and passed in some of these parameters. At this point, a server side producer is created and we send back the producer ID. We also send the producer ID to the consuming peer. Now on the consumer side, the process of requesting the transport creation and return of parameters is exactly the same as that of a producer. But for the consumer, we need to create a local receive transport. Remember, for the producer, we created a send transport. We then extract RTP capabilities of the device and together with the producer ID we received earlier, we send them back to the server. We check if the router can consume after receiving the device's RTP capabilities and passing in the producer ID. Basically, it checks if the consumer is able to consume what is produced by the producer. If all good, then we call the consume method of the server side consumer transport, passing in the RTP capabilities and the producer ID, which returns the server side consumer and send back to the client the created consumer's ID as well as a couple other parameters. We then call the consume method of the local receive transport. This fires off the transports connect event, which returns DTLS parameters. We then send these DTLS parameters back to the server and call its corresponding connect method, passing in the parameters that we just received. And by this time, media should have started streaming from the producer to the consumer. Okay, let's now look at the flow in a slightly different way. We have the router, we have the producer, and we have the consumer. Number one, first, we create a device object on the producer peer as well as on the consumer peer. 
that returns a device. We then get the RTP capabilities from the router and send to the client. And we call the devices load method and pass in the RTP capabilities, both sides. Number two, we create server-side WebRTC transport for the producer as well as the consumer. In order to call the create WebRTC transport, we need to pass in some options. For example, listen IPs, enable UDP, etc. We then get two WebRTC transport objects, one for the producer and one for the consumer. Number three, from the WebRTC transport, we retrieve some parameters. That is transport ID, ICE parameters, ICE candidates, and DTLS parameters and then we send them off to the client. We use these on the client side to create either a send transport or a receive transport. The send transport is for the producer and the receive transport is for the consumer. We get a local transport object, both sides. In the case of a producer, we call the produce method of the local transport. We pass into the method some parameters like encodings, codec options. This returns a producer. The call to the produce method triggers connect and produce events of the local transport. That's number four. The connect event, as we have seen before, returns DTLS parameters, which we send off to the server and call its corresponding transports connect method and pass in the parameters. Number five, the produce event returns parameters, specifically kind and RTP parameters, as well as a callback and an error back methods. We send these parameters to the server and call its corresponding produce method of the server side transport and pass in the received parameters. This returns a server side producer. We need the ID of this server side producer and send it back to the client. Now on the client, after receiving the producer ID, we'll use the callback method to inform the local transport that the parameters were sent to the server, as well as providing it with the producer ID we just received. The produce method also returns an error back callback in case we encounter an error. Now, by now the producer is streaming media to the server. Number six, the consumer client needs to consume that streaming media. From the consumer side, we extract RTP capabilities of the device and send them over to the server. These RTP capabilities together with the existing producer ID, we check with the router if this consumer with the submitted RTP capabilities is able to consume media from the existing producer with that producer ID. If it can, we call the consume method of the server side consumer transport. This returns a server side consumer object and from it we extract some params, consumer ID, kind, RTP parameters, and we send them off to the client. We then call number seven, we then call the consume method of the receive transport and pass in the parameter we just received. This call returns a client-side consumer object and triggers a connect event of the receive transport. The connect event returns DTLS parameters, which we send to the server and call the connect method of the corresponding server-side consumer transport. And the consumer should start receiving media from the server. If you understood this flow, you should be able to build your solution, whether it is one-to-one -one video chat or group video conference of any kind. Let us now have a quick look at the sequence diagram for when peers drops or closes their connections. Scenario one is when the producer closes a connection and scenario two is when the consumer closes the connection. Let us start with scenario one. The producer connection drops, either an issue with connectivity or the browser is closed. Our solution has to pick that disconnect. You have to know that MediaSoup will not automatically pick the disconnect. So for instance, we monitor all the connections via WebSockets. For example, we use socket.io. The moment we receive a disconnect event, we need to call the close method of the producer's transport and then call the close method of 
the producer itself. By closing the producer, a closed method event on the server side consumer will be triggered, in which we then call the closed method of the server side consumer transport. We then need to inform the client to call the closed methods of the received transport as well as the local consumer. Scenario two is pretty straightforward. When the consumer client drops connection, the server side disconnect event is triggered. We then call the closed methods of the server side consumer transport and consumer objects. And that's it, we're good to go. In the next video, we will see how to set up our environment, install MediaSoup and all the dependencies we need for our project, write code and manually demonstrate the flow we have just discussed to a successful connection between a producer and a consumer. In my case, I used a Docker container to run my MediaSoup server. See you in the next video.